Hi, Will Academy podcast listeners. It's wonderful to have you back listening to the show. Apologies on my end. I have taken one month off from the podcast. And that was basically due to the big workload um, that I had in September and beginning of October, where I organized and uh, moderated the Schneider Group's Will Connect online grower conference. And that just took up so much energy that I had to catch up a little bit uh, during the last month. And also I had to arrive at 40 years because last week was my birthday. So I also took some time off with family and friends. And, uh, but one of the great outcomes from the WooConnect conference was that I was able to reach out and connect with some new interesting interview guests for the show. And this is what today's episode is all about. Um, I've connected with Mark Ferguson. He actually also has a podcast called The Head Shepherd. And I'll also ask you to check his podcast out. And Mark and I, we are launching this interview at the same time on both of our podcasts. Um, so this episode is actually just a conversation between the two of us, um, both sharing and learning from each other in the area of our expertise. So Mark is an expert on sheep genetics and his consulting business um, helps wool growers around the world, and, but with a big focus on Australia and New Zealand to improve their sheep lab and other also the livestock so he has a great um yeah big area of expertise not only in sheep but also other um, animal fibers so without further ado i hope you enjoyed this discussion and i'll talk to you again at the end bye for now well welcome elizabeth fantastic to be doing a dual podcast with you today uh evening my time morning your time and uh yeah we both run podcasts so we thought it'd be a great idea to, to do one together yeah, I've actually never um, done an interview with another podcast host, so it's really exciting and um, to learn and yeah, discuss what our experience is. So thanks for asking and yeah, taking the initiative. Excellent. No worries at all. Uh, obviously, we're going to run this as a conversation, so we'll start with maybe your story. And I don't think you grew up with a wool background, but now somewhere along the line, you fell in love with wool, so I'd be keen to, keen to understand how that happened. Yeah, um, so I've been already working in the wool industry since 2011. So I guess next year is my 10 year anniversary. And um, it all started, um, well, like my family background is already in the textile industry. My ancestors used to be, uh, you know, own spinning and weaving mills. And you see that painting in the background of a farmer's lady on the spinning wheel. Um, so I thought that was quite um, suitable for my office when I found okay. it here in, in the house where my grandmother, that my grandfather and my grandmother built. And um, then my, yeah, my father also is a textile engineer. And so I've always been connected to textiles and, and more textile industry and that fashion in that sense. And, but then yeah, my studies and work background was communications and I used to work for a PR agency and then I started did another master's degree in London at the it was strategic fashion marketing and I had to choose a master thesis and I had like no idea what I wanted to write about and that was it was 2009 and that was around the time when the campaign for wool was started in the UK by his royal highness and and then I, I kept you know reading about it in like Ecotexta News and other magazines, and I thought that was quite an interesting topic to you know I, I looked at sustainability on an industry level, in, and the wool industry was my case so to say, and that's yeah when I started reading and learning more more and more about wool and the wool industry, and when I finished my thesis, I actually said to my mom, I don't want to work anywhere else than in wool <laughs> so, yeah. and that kind of pretty much narrowed my you know area of where i could find a job but luckily also through my thesis i was in contact with the iwto and luckily um, they hired me at the time 
And that's where my career started at the International Wool Textile Organization. And of course, um, having like no real experience in the wool industry, then I, I had access to so many wonderful people in the wool industry, got to travel to a lot of uh, wool growing countries um, and processing countries. And that's how I yeah, just learned about wool more and more on the job and became more and more passionate. And I'm sure it's the same for you, like once you're in wool, you kind of cannot stop. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's uh, somewhat addictive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. And how's what's your story? How did you get into sheep? Uh, yeah, I guess I was so yeah, grew up on a farm, so it was uh, hard to avoid sheep. Uh, so I grew <laughs> up in northwest Victoria uh, in a region called the Mallee, which is sort of low rainfall area, mainly cropping these days, but used to be sort of standard sheep and wheat type property so yeah my uncle and my grandfather ran a few sheep on the property uh, my brother and I I think I'm not sure what day we actually started in Angora goats um, so my first love was mohair uh, mm -hmm. and then and then so that morphed into so my brother and I started breeding those and then we started breeding some bottles of sheep and then uh, yeah so the farm was a big part of of growing up and my brother still is on home at home uh, farming and then, yeah, off to university and uh, ended up working on a, on a research station that was uh, and in a research project, which was heavily focused on, on merinos and uh, yeah, really started my journey in, in sort of understanding and wanting to know everything there is to know about a merino sheep from, from then on. Uh, and then that led me to a PhD, which I completed in, in merino genetics. Um, I guess always passionate about, about breeding and, and then over that early career, really got passionate about, about Merino wool. And, uh, then sort of one of the, one of the crossroads in life, uh, got, uh, ended up applying to do a review for, for the New Zealand Merino company, um, and did a bit of work for them. They were looking to, uh, I guess, change the, the Merino industry or expand the Merino industry in, in New Zealand and yeah, had the opportunity to do that work and then that resulted in being offered a position in New Zealand. So I moved to New Zealand from, I was in Perth at that stage. So I moved to New Zealand with family and worked for the New Zealand Marina company for six years, which was fantastic, which is really, I really got exposed to the other end of the, of the world, the, the world that you know much better than I, uh, in terms of processing and, and the brands, whereas I'd always been sort of, uh, I guess, pre farm gate. And yes, yeah, so I did that for six years and, um, and then, kind of always wanted to do my own thing. So we started next gen three years ago to, to provide consultancy services to mainly to wool growers, but to sheep producers, beef producers, uh, we go across sort of a broad range of livestock these days, but, uh, yeah, Merino fine wool is certainly a big part of what we do. So you have already, uh, on hand breeding experience since you were like a teenager or yeah, since I think I don't know, I was eleven or twelve or something when we first yeah. got them, and um, and we threw everything in there. Everything, we loved. Like we went to South Africa to get genetics, and been to South Africa four or five times looking at goats, and yeah, no, we got <laughs> we got we got right into it. Um, and I think both, I guess, Angora is one of the interesting things about them is they're really prolific fiber producers, and it's a again, it's a beautiful natural fiber, uh, and it really there's a lot of similarities between breeding fiber animals regardless of of the species i suppose but um yeah and i met my honors my honors was actually in alpacas so i've done a few different fiber producers um, okay but but um but yeah. i like when you breed like any animal but let's say sheep isn't it like you don't have immediate results right you always have to wait until the lambs are born and until they're grown up a little bit to see yeah you yeah it's, to, a slow, it's like a long game yeah it's a slow game long game and <laughs> and i'm not known for my patience but um but i guess the beauty of these days is that because we're working across several lots and lots of businesses so we so kind of we don't have to wait because we just go to the next farm we see the next <laughs> we need to see the next <laughs> thing and um whereas yeah certainly in our own breeding programs yeah you do one mating and you pretty much can't wait to do the next one because you just want to see those results and go to the next one it is um that's the i guess the frustrating part about breeding although we with the tools we use these days we we have a lot more certainty around the result and so we can um 
yeah, it's it's less less frustrating, but it's still mm. still part of the problem is or part of the battle is that it's 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 a slow game, but but it's still um, it's going to take the rest of my lifetime. And I'll still be still still be still be challenged. There'll be still lots of challenges to do. We can we'll never breed the perfect sheep, so it's mm. it's a good gig to be in. Yeah, because for me with communications, what I really like is that you can publish something immediately on a website or on a post. So you have that instant and you might even get, you know, quite quickly some some comments or feedback, etc. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, that's what we look into. <laughs> so a lot of what we do is, yeah, putting stuff on. We get direct feedback from social media. So we, yeah. we do plenty of that as well, but yeah. And explain to me the name of your company, Next Gen Agri. What does it stand uh, for? So next generation, I suppose, in terms of a bit of a play on words, in terms of next generation being breeding, um, so but also being trying to be at the forefront of, of agriculture, I suppose, is, is where that name came from. It, it was, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago where we sort of started Next Gen Agri, had sort of one client for a while, for a long time, mm -hmm. while we we're doing other jobs, sort of a bit of side hustle for a fair while. Um, but yeah, really... Next generation is a is a play on the breeding. Um, we we are focused on on genetics. Um, we do a little bit of nutrition work and some project work uh, outside of that, but um, which is sort of more next generation in its more common sense, I suppose. Which, uh, but yeah, yeah. That's, that's no, I like the name because it has. You can when I asked you before, you know, it's either generation or genetics. It can and it's yeah. both that you work with. Yeah, so. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the X, and the X is a big chromosome, so that's yeah, that's how oh, that yeah, works. Yeah. True. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Anyway, the um... and what do you think is the value um, for you know wool growers or um, meat producers to work with you and, and invest into their breeding? So I guess uh, genetic gain is sort of three or four percent improvement on your on. The performance of the animals if you get it right and that's that's pretty much a free hit so keeping up with inflation um or better than inflation um through through continually improving animals i guess we think of it fairly globally we don't just think about how you make them more productive we think about how we improve their welfare um by making them well, i guess less susceptible to, dis to diseases uh and as well as producing more I guess a a product that's that's best suited to the market. So it's a lot of there's a lot of, a lot to it. But yeah, I guess uh, generally in the sheep industry across the globe, we don't meet anywhere near the potential genetic gain that that we could. Uh, the dairy industry is probably the only industry. Well, there's a few others, but um, and, and and dairies, chickens, pigs, those sort of things actually get theoretical great rates of genetic gain. Whereas in the sheep industry and beef industries where we lag behind that. So that's what I guess gets us out of bed every morning is, is trying to help the sheep industry get the best out of genetics. And it's not, as I said, it's not just about driving productivity. It's about making those animals better suited to the environment so that we can use less pesticides and and keep those animals healthier and happier and and meet, meet consumer needs, but also meet the needs of, of the farmers which we serve. And why do you why do you say that like compared to chicken or dairy like has there not been that much investment and that much research in genetics for sheep or why uh, is we know there all, we, lack or gap we know we know all there is to well yeah we know similar things it's it's mainly the structure of the industry is is quite uh is, is broad whereas in like in chickens and and pork it's generally big breeding companies that do their internal breeding programs and and it's probably i don't know less than 20 pig breeding companies in the world and it's maybe similar for chickens in terms of real big breeding programs whereas in sheep there's tens of thousands of breeding programs or maybe hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of breeding programs across the globe um yeah so it's a bit about and it's a lot about how they run as well so we run across such broad different types of of uh, environments and and so one certainly one sheep doesn't suit all and whereas in more I guess intensive species you can you can control a lot of that through through sheds and um, temperature control and particular feeds and things which whereas a sheep has to be well, uh, generally out uh, outside in 
a, a range of environments and you need to actually tailor the genes for that particular environment which uh which makes it less less suitable to those massive big breeding mm -hmm. companies but yeah so there's yeah. some there's some key differences but i would yeah. think that's a strength actually for for wool or the sheep industry that there's a huge then variety and and not like the gene pool is wide no that should be better yeah yeah i mean there's we could make we could make great genetic gain and we do make great genetic gain where we get where we get everything lined up it's just that uh it's just that's sort of more it is less common i suppose than what it is in the in the other industries um mm -hmm. for a whole heap of reasons and i guess one of them being that um, wool industry is is somewhat linked to tradition and so there's so there's some sort of people that like to I guess hold on to those traditions and, and fair enough uh, but generally as we know in every part of our lives technology new information makes things better and better and if we don't grab those in in the sheep industry then we do just lag behind and and I love the the traditional part of our industry as much as anyone and, and they're things to cherish but we need to to blend that with the technology to help us breed better animals. Mm. Okay. Okay. My, before you ask me one question, I have one more uh, because <laughs> uh, because I actually know I don't understand anything about breeding and genetics. That's always an area that that I wasn't really you know in touch with and so on. And one of your sentences on on your website struck me. It was we focus on converting the complicated language and systems of genetic science into intuitive decisions. So can you translate that into like? my language i don't know like how give me an example what would that be so i guess our our clients want to know basically which ram to use and which you use to keep that's that's how it okay. essentially works uh to do that we use uh genomics so we look at uh we take dna samples off animals get that converted into what's called an estimated breeding value uh which brings in a lot of information that they've measured themselves and often we help them with that it goes through a fairly complex sort of algorithm and that into the best estimate of the set of genes that, that animal has for a whole range of different uh, traits and and so there's a whole heap of numbers a whole heap of abbreviations a whole heap of acronyms that um that kind of we look at and utilize to help farmers to pick rams that that suit them best and because often they're picking rams once or twice a year and then they don't do it for another 365 days and so it's really hard for me to know how to do anything 365 days ago and the same for a farmer and they're they're a plumber one day and a mechanic the next and an electrician the day after they're doing lots of different things on farm mm -hmm. and so genetics is is just another thing to do um so we i guess we live and breathe the acronyms and the um and the science and and help help them sort of put that into just straight decisions which is this ram's the best for the job and these are used that we should keep for the job so that's i guess that's essentially what we do is try and make try and make the uh try and make it the decision simple but without dumbing it down i think there's a risk in our industry or in any industry that that making things simple means that um it gets down dumbed down to a level that's not actually useful anymore um And so what we want to do is yeah, be aware of all the science, but, but make the decisions fairly clear for, for the people that we serve. Mm. And that you can, yeah, you remember what you did last year and you can continue best. Yeah. Okay. That makes yeah. sense to me. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. It's my turn to ask you a few questions. And um, I think, I guess the more I go on in my career, the more I understand, understand the importance of communications um storytelling such a, a powerful tool and is, is really at the heart of heart of uh heart of leadership what drove you to i guess start a business helping helping the wool industry yeah it actually always struck me so you know at adam till we we used or we all i mean the organization still does that um, organize two events per year so the adam till congress and the wool round table and of course there's also lots of working groups where people meet and discuss different issues um, for related to wool and pretty much at every meeting 
you know, people would stand up and say, yeah, but we need to communicate more or we need to tell the story and we need to, you know, make this better known and so on. And I always felt like, yeah, but why, like, why do we keep saying that? But actually it seems we're not doing it, you know? So why is there constantly this request, but it seems nobody's ever satisfied that there's enough being done in that sense. And, and don't get me wrong, I think there's a lot of, um, organizations in the wool industry uh, that communicate, you know, like the Wuma company, the IWTO, and each country has also the industry body who, who's also doing marketing. And I think everyone's doing a great job and it's it's highly needed. And, and you know that also from the New Zealand Merino company that um, they're also excellent in, in communicating. Um, but it seems there needs to be like done more and that's when I said, okay, my background is communications. I love wool. <laughs> so it's like a match uh, <laughs> made in heaven. So, to say. so that's why I decided to go down that route because I love communicating and I, I love wool. So um, yeah, that's how I oh, had yeah, that cool. idea. <laughs> Excellent. And you're right. Like we, I sit in lots of meetings still or not many of them these days, most on Zoom, but yeah, where everyone's it is a catch cry we have to tell our story better and and i think it's so true like we actually do need to tell our story better and and i guess we need to work out how to do that um i see from your website that you work across a whole heap of businesses across um across the supply chain which must give you an amazing insight into how the wool industry is ticking are we are we on the right track are we in the right industry or should we go and work in pigs or something <laughs> well i think as i already <laughs> stated that you know, you fall, once you fall in love, you'll, you'll always be in love. And I think everyone you meet in the wool industry is so passionate about wool that I think it's almost like we can't really work anywhere else. So yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know if we have a choice, um, <laughs> but for sure. I mean, with the companies that I work with at the moment, it's, it's so two examples. One is Core Merino from South Africa. They're, they produce base layer next to skin garments also like for outdoor sports and of course that over the past years we've all seen has been a big growing market um, so of course that's exciting to to be working along with that company and they're always you know actively trying to communicate all different aspects about wool and doing sports and wool and so on and then also, as, as you know, I'm, I also work with the Schneider Group um, and, and that working with them is exciting as well because they heavily focus on, um, as a top maker, they focus on sustainability, on transparency, on traceability. Um, so all of these topics are, of course, also um, like very, very important and timely at the moment. So, of course, for me, my, that makes my job great to, to be able to work in and on these topics because they're so crucial right now yeah yeah for sure uh, one of my many favorite quotes is the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's taken place uh, which is credited to george bernard shaw what are the principles of of getting a good news story of wool to the masses yes i actually had to look that quote up because i haven't <laughs> heard of it and if i understand it correctly it means that we thought we have communicated something or like I, that I, I think I told my husband that he should pick up the dog or something, but then actually I didn't, right? It's kind of related that we think we've said something, but we haven't. And I would maybe even take that further, like maybe we've said something once, but we actually have to say it 10,000 times more, not maybe to our husband, but um, <laughs> when yeah. we communicate, um, like, for us, I guess it maybe like I get bored, for example, when I see um, someone saying, oh, wool is natural or wool is biodegradable and then just the picture and the word. And I think we need to, um, that's for me, that's kind of advertising. Um, but yeah, I think we need to be telling more of stories and not only saying or claiming that wool is this and that, but actually showing all everything of the wool industry, of growing sheep, of shearing, um, processing. And um, so, 
Yeah, and, and everyone has to do that. It's not enough that all the industry bodies are doing that or that big companies are doing that. Actually, each and every one of us needs to tell their side and their story connected with wool. And I think that's when you, because you asked me about how do we get a new story to the masses by being the masses and communicating <laughs> massively. Um, and also the, the term masses is, has changed as well because in like a few decades ago, you know, there used to be TV channels and, and newspapers and journalists would be kind of the bottleneck where you could hope that they would pick up your story. Um, but now we have so many different channels. For example, I don't watch normal TV anymore. No, I stream and then I watch things on YouTube and on social media. So the mass media that we used to know wouldn't actually reach me. And that's that makes even when more important that each and every one communicates via whatever channel you want and you will find an audience you might not find you know millions and millions of people but one tribe you know of a thousand people or a hundred people that are interested in hearing your story is then already enough because everybody else would also be telling their story so yeah i think communications has changed a lot and we need to adapt in that sense as well yeah cool and i think i think what i like about everything you just said was that it was never they should be doing something i think we in our industry and in maybe others but it's always it's easy to say that they whoever they are and it might be the awto or it might be awi or it might be somebody else um they should be doing this whereas i think it's it's the opportunity for it's the obligation of all of us to actually do things for ourselves expecting someone else to do it is not is mm. not really the way things change and yeah and one thing shouldn't replace the other so it's not like we're not saying stop paying a levy or something you know i think the work that's being done by these organizations still is vital and then it's also vital that other people let's say on on more of a you know european union you united nations level also communicate and then each and every one, each business uh, needs to communicate. So we need to have, you know, all levels uh, covered. And um, maybe also if, if you think as if you're a grower and you, you run a business, right? So, and part of business is always also marketing and communications. So, and then in addition, you're also a member of an industry body. So you need to see it as both. It's not like, like the industry body is doing your marketing. No, they're doing the industry marketing and you as a business have to do your own marketing. And that could be that, I mean, I see more and more farmers also have their own website or using Instagram and Facebook. Um, so there's so many different options. And, and also, I mean, these communication channels that we have available today are really, really low cost. So we've never been able to communicate across the world at such a low cost. So yeah, I think exactly. you need to integrate it into, into your business. And your opinion is that it does matter for, so everyone listening to this on the head shepherd side on, on our podcast side will be mostly farmers. Uh, and I guess your advice to them would be that they should be should be communicating they should be telling their story on one of those channels or, or some of those channels yeah definitely and and i'm always a little bit jealous because i live here in germany on the dutch border i have no sheep in my yard unfortunately so it's really hard for me to come up with content and with i can't click a picture every day of a, a pretty sheep or my paddocks and maybe for your wool growers it seems so normal to be looking at you know the pastures each day and there's like who's, who would be interested in that but I mean I think you know there's such a big disconnect between rural and urban populations and and we need to close that gap and actually show what's happening in in the rural areas how you know people don't really know anymore how things are being done, but I think more and more because of communications and transparency and because the technology exists, people do want to know and find out because it's possible. 
and and that's we need to feed <laughs> this uh, desire to connect more with nature to better understand to know how things are done why things are done certain ways um and and yeah tell that story and to, maybe to your wool growers it seems normal to be doing this and that like for you it's normal to be breeding you know know everything about genetics but for me it's like how do you decide which ram to use why and when do you do it and yeah. i i'm yeah. you know so these for you maybe mundane or normal questions of everyday life can actually be really interesting and and i think it's important to also be just honest and um yourself so if you're a humorous person and you like to you know be humorous if you're more of a moody person <laughs> you know show that and um like for example i i follow there are some there's a gay couple in the u.s farming dairy and there's some, some sheep and they have a wonderful instagram account i follow them you know and and then there's a you know a woman who who's uh, farming sheep i think in the us and she every day she posts something about what she, like even if it's cleaning the shed or something yeah. and and so every you know everybody has a different angle and you know you also maybe know leslie pryor in the uk she's like um a, a lady you know taking on the british uh, sheep industry yeah. and she posts <laughs> yeah. a lot and she even put you know and she's very honest also if she has a bad day or now because of the corona pandemic she posted once like more and more people went out into the fields to have picnics and then they left all that trash in on her pastures so then she you know she talked about these issues that also happen and and just be honest about it so yeah, share yeah. the good and the bad and be transparent yeah, I think, be yourself i think one of the great things of living somewhere where i didn't grow up is that i'm more likely to see the beauty in in what's around me whereas obviously if you've lived somewhere all your life you've lived on that farm all your life or for a significant part you can just drive past some some amazingly beautiful things or even just yeah just some mundane things to you but it but it it might really ignite somebody somewhere and and grow their passion for for the fiber that, that we're passionate about yeah and i think adding i think we need to stop seeing you know wool as a commodity or something and if you if we add this communications and storytelling it adds value to our product because our product is not a chemical pushed through some machine that always comes out the same way um we have these beautiful stories and we're actually creating something with animals humans and nature to make something and and yeah the chemical fibers cannot tell these beautiful stories so that's really an advantage for us yeah massively i was on a on a station today and i realized when i got home at seven o'clock or whatever it was i hadn't actually checked my watch for the entire day <laughs> i was because it didn't really matter because we just yeah. like yeah you know you're in the right you know you're in a job in the right job for you when you're not when you're not mm -hmm. ever looking at your watch because it's it's all good fun and yeah and the environment is yeah just stunning where it was today and and often is um we should move on to the wool connect conference which is probably why we're chatting because that's where i first came across you um mm -hmm. i thought it was a obviously tiring for you that the conference <laughs> a little bit <laughs> <laughs> So it came together quite quickly, did it? Yeah. So we, I think, organized the whole thing in six weeks. Yeah, and and yeah. then, um, but we were quite happy with the outcome and um, the interest and the level of speakers, et cetera. So, and there's plans to do another one next year or? Yeah. Hopefully we can pull that off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess while we're on that, we should say that anyone who if you sign up now you could still get to watch the recordings can you or yeah exactly so you can still buy a ticket and then you just watch the videos at your own time or just the ones yeah. you want to watch yeah yeah cool so i guess um one thing that yeah i'm keen to talk about and i think you're keen to talk about as well is is that off those 30 plus speakers i think carbon and animal welfare were mentioned by well, most of the ones I watched anyway, and you you would have, you listened to them all. So, mm. um, I guess what is 
um is this like a new thing or is is this just the the momentum is finally switching to we need to change and we need to change soon across i mean i guess i don't want to combine those two things but i guess musing or, or animal welfare generally but musing is one of the big things um in what in your work is what are you what are you saying has it been just a slow build and now it's sort of getting getting breaking point or um yeah i think you know the world isn't binary so there's always yeah, yeah. a lot of factors coming together but let's maybe start with the carbon and climate story and what struck me when you know i was preparing um for every speaker and i've asked them you know how long have you been in the business and how long have you been in the job etc and around about everyone was doing their job on sustainability and in whatever brand they were in for around a decade now and that tells you also that they've come a long way no they've and and also that's maybe to understand about sustainability it's a new field of research we're still unclear how to measure climate impact properly you know um research there's this research coming out all the time um even for wool you know we said oh this is the best method to measure like do wool lca and now we're saying oh no actually there's a better method to be more accurate um so so it's an evolving topic and that's also the problem that a lot of people say this is sustainable and the others say no it's not sustainable so um and these companies have been working on sustainability for 10 years and in the beginning they started with you know saving energy and reducing their own paper waste and so on but now and that's where you know other so other trends come in we have the united nations sustainable development goals i think they were published in 2015 I'm correct. And then we have, you know, last year was, or was it this, last year, this year, the United Nations um, Sustainable Fashion Pact. And more and more of these initiatives are coming together. And what has changed now is that companies are now committing to certain goals by a certain date. And that is what now makes things a little bit move a little bit faster because now they're publicly committed and they have to meet these goals and in addition we now you know in the beginning let, let's say 10 years ago you could say oh this is sustainable and we're saving energy now you have to actually measure everything and benchmark everything um, you know it's the science-based targets for example so things are becoming much more concrete and people are now realizing okay i think you know we have to really be professional, be transparent, tra traceable, <laughs> and, and move forward. Um, so that's, I think, why it now seems to be everywhere, but it, it has been building up over the past yeah. 10, and now we're like reached a certain level. And of course, more and more brands have also, you know, joined. there were a few leading brands in the beginning, but now more and more um, have joined as well. Yeah, certainly a groundswell. And I guess that was my assumption is it's just been building and now yeah, everyone's in a hurry to make change and yeah, yeah i didn't yeah when i attended i was i guess one of the last fairs of this year in, in ispo in the end of J january beginning of february um and i noticed because i've i've gone for, for a few years to those fairs and i've noticed this year that actually especially let's say in that hall where most wool brands are all of them had something on their stand written with sustainability and now they had to differentiate themselves <laughs> by saying we've been doing sustainability since 1972 and we've been doing sustainability since 1980 so all of a sudden they all pull out these old numbers saying that they've been sustainable for much because now you need to even differentiate yourself somehow within the topic of sustainability you can't just say we're sustainable because now everybody is saying that so of course there's yeah lots of movement and action and competition and um does that yeah. get confusing for our, our, our consumers keeping up? Are we, are they, no, and I think work? that's a lot, yeah, a, a whole different topic, of course. Not of, of, um, because you said that also in the beginning that I think we're sometimes trying to simplify too much and then it's not 
helping anymore or giving the wrong message. And of course, that's what's happening, for example, with the HIG index from the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. And I mean, there has been now some, a lot of debate this week or, um, about that as well. So, and, and it's important for the wool industry to be there and to define these labels and these benchmarking tools because that's what will end up on the product and will inform the consumer. And if that's not favoring wool in any way, then that's of course a long-term uh, disaster for wool. So mm. that's where a lot of the industry bodies are proactively working um, to ensure that you know, the rating tools to say what is sustainable and what is not. And that also connects what I said earlier, we're still trying to figure out how to measure sustainability. Um, yeah, that's really crucial. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and with, I mean, with mule sing, it's, it's the same that now the dates to by when the brands want to source 100% mule sing free wool are coming closer. And I think what maybe happened in the beginning is that a lot of brands then just shifted they're sourcing to countries that are naturally mule sing free. But now, you know, that capacity has maybe been reached. And if they want to, you know, source the amount of wool they, they need mule sing free, then they have to turn, you know, back to Australia um, and find solutions on how to, to reach their goals. Yeah. So you also, because I saw you also offer video courses and one of the upcoming one will be about preventing fly strike or? Yeah, so we, um, yeah, so we've kind of got three bits to our business, which I didn't really cover, but the yeah, one is is the consulting stuff, uh, helping people. We've got another one, which is yeah, communicating, educating, I suppose, online courses, which was on the car, well, it was sort of slowly happening pre-COVID, but was given a big hurry up in COVID um, being locked in your house helps for that sort of stuff. Uh, and then the other part is the innovation part. So we're doing some, some interesting things and we often do them for other organizations, but yeah. So um, yeah, education is, I guess, a big passion of mine and helping, helping farmers and young people in the industry to, to, I guess, adopt best practice. And yeah, I guess one of the things that, um, we did a review for Meat and Livestock Australia around fly strike uh, with a group of um, other university professors. Uh, I was definitely the, the lightweight on the group, um, and they, yeah. So we did a review on on sort of the opportunity to around fly strike and and the sort of I guess the yeah, and mainly it is around genetics. There's a big opportunity to breed sheep that are much less prone to fly strike through a whole heap of mechanisms. Um, and some of those make them less, well, don't, they, they therefore don't require mulesing, but there's, there's others in addition to that that make them even more fly prone. So that, yeah, that course is one that I actually wrote uh, a number of months ago and then it was winter. So I didn't think it'd be uh, a good time to release it, but we need to, we're just recording it at the moment to release it. But um, I see a real opportunity or a real need to help people transition from mulesing. We're seeing, I've listened to, will connect and, and you know way better than I, but there's, yeah, there's a, there's a growing tension and passion and need to, um, to, to have, yeah, to have non mules wool from the, from the brands and, and that creates problems or creates, creates the challenges for farmers who haven't moved in that direction through their own, through their own means. So we need to, um, yeah, so that course is really going to be around creating a bit of a community around people that are changing to people that have changed and try and try and grow as well. Provide some information, provide the sort of what we know about the genetics of, of that, as well as some of the management things, some of the strategic uses of chemicals, I guess, living in New Zealand now, um, which did swap more well, did drop using relatively quickly and now has banned it. Um, so there's still a range of genotypes here. Not all of them are what you would consider the, a really plain body merino, which are the ones that, that generally don't need to be mules, but through careful management and careful chemicals use, um, then they do fly, they do farm relatively fly free. Um, and, and 
without without music. So yeah, I guess trying to pull that together in a course and and really help help those that are interested in in changing away from using to to go through that process and hopefully without hopefully without some of the problems that some people have encountered by learning from others that have gone through that process. I guess the beauty of about of what we do is that normally people are learning more from the other people in the course than they are learning from me. Um, there's, there's always much more knowledge in the room than, than on the other side of the screen. And, and I guess we're just there to try and facilitate that discussion. And that's, and that's a great thing about of what we achieved uh, through, like through lockdown, we had, we had Friday night drinks and it was just people talking about their farming mechanisms and sort of young people listening to less young people um, um, and, and learning. And that was across from Western Australia to, across North Island, South Island, New Zealand, all people just chatting about, about running sheep, which is, which is a fantastic um, part of what we do. Mm. But yeah, but that, yeah, that course particularly is, is uh, yeah, driven around, I guess, a strong desire of, of mine to, to breed really high welfare sheep uh, and, and a strong knowledge, I suppose that we can't, we won't have the chemicals available to us that we've got today forever. Um, either the flies will get resistant or the consumers will say we can't use them. Um, and so we need to be breeding genotypes uh, that, are, that are set up for that. And as you covered earlier, breeding is slow. It not, doesn't happen overnight. So if we don't start now, we don't have any solution in 10 years where if we start now and some of this stuff, we, we move and we, um, yeah, things, things get better or we're ready when things change rather than sort of having to react when, mm. when it's too late. So. And what do you think is the biggest like hurdle or challenge for wool growers to, you know, take that step towards uh, using free sheep? I think it's the biggest one is mindset. Um, and that's really easy to say, but I do genuinely believe that people, farmers are amazingly their initiative when they want to want to achieve something they can achieve uh, anything the same as any human can obviously but but particularly farmers are they're used to pulling together bits and pieces and, and making something of it and and so they can they're great problem solvers that's what they do for a living and so when they decide to stop they you know, some some people make some mistakes and and need to, and and change a few things but generally those that have that have changed um have done it done it really well and, and been effective so it is a a big mindset shift it's a it's a type of sheep shift it's a um yeah it's it's a it's a it's a need to actually believe that we need to listen to the consumer that we don't get to tell people that buy our products what how it's going to be because they're the ones with the credit card at the end of the day um and so yeah i think there's certainly there's no doubt there's some genotypes out there which are much much less or much more difficult to manage without without a surgical practice of mulesing. Uh, but we know that people have moved away from that. They've taken the, the early warnings back when there was earlier deadlines um, and have and have moved well away from it to the um, and are not going broke in the process. So they've actually got productive sheep. They've got healthy sheep. They've got um, yeah. They've got income streams for, for a range of things. And yeah. So I think there's uh there's a big opportunity to 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 shift the industry that way and certainly um certainly that's what we want to be part of um uh trying to or or just helping people i think i think we've unfortunately ended up in a situation where it's kind of the mules versus the non mules and it's not very healthy and it's not very helpful um no. so so i don't want to contribute further to the controversy really it's more about that it's it's never been in my mind since I think in 2000, um, there's a guy in New Zealand, David Scobie, who, um, who I heard talk and he said that mulesing was going to go then. And, and it made sense immediately made sense to me that that would be true. And I've always thought since then, it's not a matter of if it's when, um, and, and that's true. Like it's, it was more true today than it was then, but it's, it's like, it's probably taken that's two decades ago now, but, and that's, that things take time but yeah it's definitely going to be if not when and people and so we need to be prepared we need to have we need to have a great fiber produced without without the only really sort of negative thing that's hanging over the industry um which which excites some 
some i guess welfare groups and and stuff and 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 fair enough it's it's a um yeah it's a process that we that i don't think we need in the industry mm. yeah i mean there's a lot of things that now come to mind to, to, uh, to say but okay one thing back to communications that's even more a reason to communicate every day about what you do as a sheep farmer because it it changes the narrative to not only musing but to everything else that you do you know you you sequester carbon in your soil you improve the biodiversity on your land um you you know do so many other things for welfare of your sheep um so those are all positive stories that we also need to tell so that one musing story isn't the only one that we communicate about or you know or try not to communicate yeah. about in, in many instances as well yeah. and then i think what you said you know it seems like there's like a musing and non-using kind of groups and, and and also on the wool connect of course you know we had a lot of people yeah but who's going to pay for it and so much burden for the wool growers and i agree and i think that's what also wool connect was trying to achieve is that we cannot no longer just say, yeah, we need this. Okay, so you have to do that. No, we have to actually have a dialogue between all of us and that we all understand the needs, the needs that the consumers have, the needs that the processors and the manufacturers have, but also the needs that the wool growers have and understand the issues like why can't you change or why, you know, why does it take so and so long? And, and maybe find, you know, some intermediate you know solutions together because i don't think the issues that we have today we can solve you know just by one group or one person etc we need to always work together and that's why i would challenge you for your course that you also you know ask someone from for example from the schneider group to also have one lesson or you know mm -hmm. one talk yeah 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 um from that side because we need to have the different voices and or take part in one of the, the you know group discussions that you have maybe the it won't be beer and wine then uh, but a coffee <laughs> yeah um, you have to have coffee yeah so that's a good because, yeah, very yeah good point. we need to i think stop you know working in silos and the, because a lot of solutions may be developed you know in one silo it would be a solution by the retailers or the growers but we actually need to work those solutions together so that they work and can be accepted by everyone yeah 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 no definitely and i guess that's probably highlighted by the proliferation of, of different standards and like a one thing on that conference was that lots of different people with lots of different standards and how and they are they similar are they different and that's yeah. for our guy for our the people we work with that's a um it's a source of confusion and frustration when you've got you're being audited for the same thing by three different people or whatever. Yeah, definitely. But I guess what I'm also a fan of um, things that a free market and things work itself out over time. You can't actually control everything, and and there's no we can't live in fairyland thinking that everyone's always going to get on and and we're going to always be collaborative. But it is, yeah, I agree 100. percent that we we need all voices in um, being heard and and doing that actively or you might just learn one little thing you know yeah. that helps, yeah. helps yeah. in some way but yeah. um that other question you you said earlier is like are the consumers really wanting this and that and i always i always have that question as well and i always ask like when i talk to manufacturers or brands is the consumer really asking you this you know and they always say yes they do and i know like some companies they had to expand their staff to you know to source wool and to and to deal with all the different requirements for um for certifications and questions and because the and and you heard that in the presentation from michelle um Mastil from Südwolle group that their product, you know, they used to do just one type of product yeah. and 40 years ago, and now they have like 40,000 products or something like that. Their, their yeah. supply chains have become so complicated because each and every yarn needs a different certification and and different traceability and so on. And 
and I think that is because consumers do want that they don't do that for fun you know it's a lot of work and cost and and there is that demand um and i think the demand is there because it's possible because we have the technology and because you're used to picking up your phone all the time and checking i mean whenever i have a question no there's no dinner conversation anymore because you can always check check or yeah so and because it's possible people want to know and they want to connect yeah, yeah, for sure. So what what do you see five years out? If we ask you the big question, um, <laughs> what's, the ne- what's the next five years got in, in store for us? Well, I think it won't be an easy ride because we're in the middle of a pandemic and when everyone's just going into second lockdown and we're still waiting for the results from the US about the election. Yeah. Um, so I think yeah, it's not going to be easy and we cannot sit idle on on our behinds. I think um, and I, I I would even say I don't know if we're going to call ourselves like wool or sheep industry in the future. I think we need to look at what we do more holistically because you know in the future we have so many issues to solve that are bigger than just our industry like climate change and biodiversity microplastics and wool and sheep are actually a big solution to those problems so i'm wondering if we you know have to position ourselves more as these solutions providers and you know custodians of the land and reversing the desertification and so on um and and you know adding value as a whole and not just producing a fiber for a garment or a carpet um so yeah i think that's and and but that we cannot just sit and wait you know oh yeah we knew wool was sustainable and biodegradable and circular fiber all along so voila here we're still here now we have to actually push our messages and and be at the table of where all these discussions are happening about circular economy, about um, you know these big issues of climate change, um, and and make ourselves known that we can be part of the solution. Um, so yeah. I think that's a big big challenge. But I think we need to look at our job. You know, jobs change nowadays. We we can't be one thing forever anymore. And, and our job descriptions, even the ones of wool growers, I think will change in that sense as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity there and it is going to be an interesting few years. What is short term? We are, things started to look a little bit up in terms of the wool market. Is, is that likely to continue? Do you know what's, what's your inside knowledge? To be honest, I never understand pricing and, and the wool market. It, yeah, that's yeah, like enough. genetics, a mystery to me. Um, <laughs> yep. I, I, was just I would hope. Yeah, yeah. I would hope that things go up again. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think because of the second lockdown um, in Europe, at least, um, I don't know how how retail etc. will react. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. I wish I had <laughs> the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, Same. that's not my field of expertise. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. How are we going? We're just about wrapped up, are we? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's been uh, very interesting. Thanks for providing some insights into what you do. And yeah, everyone uh, listening to the Vulcan podcast should also listen to. Um, it's Head Shepherd, right? Your podcast. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So it's um, again a play on words in terms of it's a leading shepherd here, or but mm-hmm. I guess a lot about mindset as well as some of what we try and try and cover. So um, yeah, but thank you very much. Where, where do we, where do our listeners find your podcast? Yeah, it's on uh, my website elizabethvandelden.com. Um, so, so Elizabeth we'll put links with in the show notes to make that easy. Not yeah. that. And also, like if you search on uh, iTunes or Google Play for Wool Academy or my name, you'll also find it. 
and it's also so on it's called YouTube. it's called wall academy podcast yeah mm-hmm. exactly yeah cool excellent well thank you so much for the chat it's been it's been great and hopefully we'll uh yeah continue to keep in touch and all the best for lockdown in europe where we're luckily in new zealand where we well we've got a couple of cases but very very few so we're quite lucky but yeah thank you so much for your time tonight this our intention is that this podcast will go on on both of our podcasts so people can find it either at all academy or at head shepherd yeah perfect and thanks for your time cool thank you (laughs) bye so I do hope you enjoyed this episode and our uh, little discussion between Mark and myself um, about sheep genetics and a lot also about communications. And uh, if you want to find out more about Mark, then head on over to the show notes at elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 117. And of course, I'll encourage you to visit the website of Mark and also check out his podcast, The Sheep, uh, no, Head Shepherd. And um, I'll link to all of that also in the show notes. So it's very easy for you to find it. So see you again in two weeks time. Thanks and bye for now.